So we're down to the third paper, which is when is it hard to make men's when is it hard to make ends meet? And uh, we have uh, Jilan Wang from University of Illinois, and the discussant will be Benjamin Keyes from Wharton. Um, thank you so much for having us um, uh, and for having our paper. So this is my first uh, project with the RRC. I hope it's not the last. Um, and as a you know, relatively young researcher, I feel the need to say I'm, I am a millennial. Um, uh, I just wanted to say how great it is to be part of this community and um, you know the existence of the RSC has certainly encouraged me to continue uh, thinking about um, you know future research in in um, this really important area so what I'm going to talk about right now um, is a project on um, financial behaviors of Social Security and also disability uh, recipients uh, so we pose the question when is it hard to en make ends meet um, and by the end of, you know, 14 minutes from now, um, I will actually uh, deliver some pretty uh, specific and concrete answers to that question. Um, and the other thing that I'll um, make a note of on, on our project is that um, sort of our, our implications are actually pretty actionable relative to some of the really big um, and difficult questions um, in, in the area that we're working on. Um, changing sort of the nuts and bolts um, of uh, when uh, benefits are paid is actually a relatively easy thing to do. And um, hopefully, you know, by the end of this talk, we'll have some ideas about what we can do to, um, to help uh, the financial security of benefits recipients um, while you know uh, not necessarily raising the level of benefits or changing the, the fundamental nature of the benefits programs so um, I should also note this is joint work um, with two of my co-authors and I have even more uh, disclosures than normal because um, part of this work is uh, uh, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and so certainly my remarks do not reflect uh, the opinions of of that agency um, or, or others associated with this project and are purely those of the, uh, the authors. So the first thing I'm going to try to um, convince you of um, in posing the question, when is it hard to make ends meet, is that actually um, many Americans find it very difficult to make ends meet. Um, and in particular, we have seen more and more evidence, uh, starting with um, some pioneering work by Lusardi Schneidner uh, and Tufano, um, you know, in their survey, um, about one quarter to one half of all households reported that they either definitely cannot come up with $2,000 um, to face an unexpected shock, or probably cannot come up with that amount of money. And more recently, um, in the most recent uh, survey by the Fed board um, just last year, um, almost half of individuals report that they couldn't even come up with $400 for an emergency uh, without having to sell something or borrowing on their credit cards. So this is just to set up um, the idea that many Americans find it really difficult to make ends meet and essentially uh, live paycheck to paycheck. And of course, this will include um, the, the population of Social Security beneficiaries. Um, a lot of a large percentage of those will also uh, fall into this category. Um, so let's see if um, we can make it in Z. So, um, uh, so this project in particular looks at the effect of income timing. So, kind of what I just mentioned. You know, given that many uh, individuals are living paycheck to paycheck, it stands to reason that very small perturbations, things that we might think are irrelevant, such as are you, do you get your benefits check on the first of the month or the 15th of the month that might be relevant to most of us in this room are actually really binding for a lot of people. So we're going to look at the impact specifically of exactly what I just mentioned, the, the um, timing of your income within the month and uh, whether that um, actually changes the, the, you know, sort of substantive economic outcomes of beneficiaries. So we're going to exploit um, the fact that starting in 1997, um, sort of the uh, OASDI benefits uh, began being dispersed on a uh, sort of staggered schedule. They used to be paid uh, around the third of the month uh, for all beneficiaries, but um, for those who began receiving benefits after 1997, um, benefits were sort of staggered on the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of every month, depending on the date of birth of um, the sort of uh, main beneficiary. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, you know, I'll talk about the specifics in, 
in just one second. Um, and so because um, these benefits are always paid on a specific Wednesday of each month, this also generates the additional variation that some pay periods um, are 35 days long, uh, whereas most, uh, sort of about eight pay periods per year are 28 days long, whereas the remaining four are 35 days long. So this generates sort of um, implicit variation in the uh, income per day, um, even though they get the same amount per benefits check, the sort of implicit income per day is going to vary um, depending on uh, the calendar year. So we're going to look at the causal impact of the schedule. And I didn't put it on this slide, but um, you know this variation specifically impacts um, almost 30 million beneficiaries um, who, who started claiming after 1997. Um, and I think that you know the implications will not only um, impact those 30 million, but you know the effects of income timing are very general, uh, perhaps affecting earnings, affects the timing of uh, benefits for many other kinds of benefits programs as well. Um, so this is just an illustration of what that um, uh, what the schedule is for uh, for all beneficiaries receiving some sort, some form of benefits from the SSA. Um, and so if we see in the calendar uh, behind me, uh, the focus of our study is going to be the three colored squares. Um, so those are the ones that are paid on different Wednesdays of every month, depending on the calendar cycle. Um, and as you will see, there's two other groups of, um, of beneficiaries: the SSI and also so the pre-1997 or joint SSI beneficiaries that are paid either on the first or third of the month, and we're, we're not going to focus on those in the study since, you know, always being paid near the beginning of the month, we don't have a lot of variation. We can't really separate the timing of your income from just what day of the month it is. So there have been previous studies that have looked at those groups. So um, you'll see, you can see that um, the Wednesdays happen to fall on different days of the month over the calendar year, um, which helps us in our, um, uh, you know, in, in be able to estimate the causal effect of these, and we can also see um, those uh, sort of five Wednesday months uh, create that those pay periods where beneficiaries have to stretch the same amount of income over an additional week. Um, and we can see you know, whether uh, that has an impact. Um, so in the background here, of course, with our standard you know, perfectly rational, perfectly forward-looking model, um, of course, this calendar is known in advance to all beneficiaries. So if everyone was forward-looking, um, the fact that you have a five-week pay period versus four-week pay period should not lead to more financial distress because people can uh, look ahead and save a little bit in those four-week pay periods in anticipation of the five-week pay periods. But you know, the purpose of the study is to see, do people actually do do that and do they in, uh, versus do they in fact uh, uh, fall into financial distress when they they're they're hit with these uh, five week pay periods? Uh, so um, this is just an illustration that um, you know. Uh, you know, half of this analysis is based on when those five-week pay periods happen to fall, and this just shows that um, they, they don't line up on the exact same months of every year, uh, so there's no clear um, uh, sort of calendar uh, seasonality variation. Um, every month has some um, some five-week pay periods during our sample period, which goes from 2010 to 2015. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our data sources, which I think um, this is the first time that these particular data sources have been used in studying retirement uh, um, uh, sorts of research questions. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this for those who might not be familiar with these types of data. So the first data set um, uh, you know, is becoming more commonly used in, in sort of household finance research. Uh, comes from an account aggregator. So what this means for the non-millennials out there in the room. I'm just kidding. I'm not making fun of you. Um, so so uh, is um, these are websites where you can sign up, um, and essentially it's kind of a personal financial management app. Um, and uh, you know, shockingly, perhaps to some people, what you do is you sign up and you give this website the usernames and passwords to all of your accounts. Um, and you trust that um, you know, nothing bad will happen. Uh, you know, actually, millions of people do this. So in our data set, um, in our particular account aggregator data set, we actually have th almost 3 million um, individual households that have si ha signed up. And, and some of these other ones are even bigger. Um, and of course, what you do um, is that the service then automatically scrapes all of the transactions from your bank accounts and credit cards. So our particular data set only covers those two. There's some other similar data sets that also have things like brokerage accounts. So we do want to think in the back of our mind what's missing from these data. So we don't see 401k accounts, um, retail brokerage accounts, and some other accounts. But we see sort of um, the universe of the bank transactions and uh, credit card transactions that um, ha people have linked. Um, 
Uh, and uh, sort of, I, as I already mentioned, this data set covers from 2010 to 2015. Um, you know, another thing we want to keep in the back of our mind is that this particular data set, um, and I'll talk about our second data set in a second, um, uh, is a self-selected sample. So these are people who voluntarily um, signed up for this type of service. Um, and some other descriptive uh, evidence shows that these types of data sets tend to include people who are more male, uh, have a little bit higher education, are a little bit younger than the general population. So we want to think about the external validity of our data sets. But I don't think that um, people who are uh, born on the different days of the month necessarily differentially sign up for this account. So hopefully internal validity is uh, fairly sound. Um, and I also mentioned um, the financial distress measures, which are kind of our key outcome measures. We're going to look at bank overdrafts and bounce checks, as well as online payday loans. Um, the second data set, which I'm going to not spend a lot of time on, um, is a data set of um, storefront payday loans. So this is an entirely separate, independent data set collected by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and it consists of all storefront payday loans, so you have to go to a physical store and take out a payday loan. For those not familiar, it's a type of um, very high cost, over 300% APR type of short-term credit um, that is used by uh, about 5% of U.S. households per year. Um, so we're going to look at the propensity of sort of financial distress, either in their bank accounts or in the form of uh, online or storefront payday borrowing in both of these data sets. Uh, so I'm not going to cover too much of the summary statistics, but just to highlight here, um, in our account aggregator data set, so those bank and credit card transactions, the typical Social Security income is about $1,300 per month. Um, and uh, in the bottom panel uh, uh, behind me, those financial distress or financial shortfall measures, which are going to be our outcome measures, um, uh, th that just shows the, the probability that a given household will experience a given form of financial distress in each month. So actually, um, more than 11% you know, of, of households um, have a bank overdraft per month. So this is not an uncommon type of financial distress. Um, and you, these are very costly forms of bank, uh, sort of bank shortfalls. Um, and I'll go very quickly through the storefront payday. So uh, because actually the results tend to are, are consistent with both of our, our data sets. And this just shows the Social Security income distributions for both of our data sets. Unsurprisingly, um, people who are born on the 30th day of the month are not systematically different in their um, SSA income compared with people born on the first day of the month. So these three, uh, what I'm going to call the Wednesday groups that are quasi-randomly assigned to be paid on different Wednesday the uh, different Wednesdays of the month based on their day of birth um, line up you know, almost exactly in terms of their SSA income. So we think that we can treat them as like, effectively randomly uh, signed. So this is um, our main uh, result. Um, so uh, the main result is, again, we're testing whether uh, being in a five-week pay period compared to the four-week pay period causes more financial distress. And we're also testing whether uh, being assigned to be paid on the fourth Wednesday of the month compared with the second Wednesday of the month uh, leads to more or less financial distress. So in the first set of um, uh, rows right there, we see that the long pay periods are systematically related to greater financial distress. So the way we can read this table here is that relative to the baseline percentage, so these are daily probabilities of being, for example, uh, overdrafting. So we'll just look at the first column there. So on a given day, somebody has a 0.7% likelihood of having a bank overdraft. Um, and that is, you know, is 5% higher. So this is a percent in relative terms um, if you're in a long pay period compared with a short. Um, and that's even higher, um, up to 31% for that storefront payday um, type, you know, the, probably the most severe form of uh, financial shortfall that we measure. We also see that um, if we focus on the bottom set of rows, that people who get paid near the end of the month, the fourth Wednesday group, um, are are less likely to have financial distress. So I think this is actually a really important result because this is a difference across people. This is not a difference across the same person at different times of the year or the month. So this is showing that. Due to the 1997 change in the disbursement schedule, some people um, are made worse off uh, than others. And uh, you know, uh, I'm going to explain. I'm going to spend uh, my, you know one, some of my remaining time on why we see this fourth Wednesday effect that people paid near the end of the month are less likely to uh, be in financial distress. Uh, and the reason, the hypothesis that we test, I'm not going to get a chance to get into too much detail, is that in this data set, the great thing we can do is measure not only people's income, but also their expenditures. So the hypothesis that we posed is that people paid near 
the end of the month or the beginning of the month, of course, those are kind of the same thing, um, uh, are also more likely to have large expenditures due near the beginning of the month. So mortgages, um, car loans, uh, credit card bills all tend to be due on the first of the month. So in other words, um, being uh, paid near the time when your large lumpy expenditures are due leads to lower financial distress. So you don't have to plan three weeks in advance for how much you need to save out for your mortgage. Um, so we, we, you know, we can measure these expenditures um, and actually uh, test for the role of what we call timing mismatch. So this result shows the same thing as the previous table, but measures the number of weeks of the mismatch between the day you're paid and the day that your large expenditures are due. Um, and we find that you know, one week greater of mismatch leads to a 10% um, higher chance of a bank overdraft. So I'm gonna actually going to spend um, you know, one second to just wrap up. Um, as, I, as I promised in the beginning, um, uh, you know, we're going to deliver some concrete answers to the question, when is it hard to make ends meet? Um, some of the answers that we have based on the study are that uh, it's harder during predictably longer pay periods. Um, t uh, people have more financial distress. And also when there's more timing mismatch between when you're paid and when your large lumpy expenditures are due. Um, and uh, I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, this is potentially a very fixable problem. Um, and there's a, a variety of, of, of different potential interventions that we can think of um, that could help solve this problem for beneficiaries. Thank you so much.